안녕하십니까. 2021년도 서울 국제 주얼리 컨퍼런스에 오신 감사합니다. 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 Countries, and they speak about the manufacturing of the diamond and color gemstones, and they and their distribution, origin determination, gem identification technology, thereby providing key information to the domestic industry. Due to the prolonged pandemic. Uh, we have no other option but to hold this conference uh, through the form of webinar, as we did last year. Uh, we welcome again one of you who are with us online. Moreover, a lot of friends from other countries are also participating in this webinar, and the translation is being provided for them. Uh, after the seminar is over, please, please stay online a little more, and you can fill out the questionnaires. Your opinions will be highly appreciated and will be used to advance this kind of international conferences. Uh, we have a small gift for those who participate. Uh, let me briefly introduce today's program. We have three different sessions, and the whole conference will last about two and a half hours. And the first session is given by David Block of the Serene Technology Group. He will talk about how technology is shaping the diamond industry of tomorrow. And the second session topic uh, will be given by Michael Examniki of Swiss Gemological Institute. He will talk about the beauty of science. Uh, lastly, uh, the title is Laboratory Grown Diamond Market in Korea, which will be given by Mr. Hyun Sung On of Wargok Jewelry Research Center. We really look forward to hearing from these three experts. And after each session, uh, we have a que question and answer at session. If you want, you can leave any questions on the YouTube live chat. And we will select a few of them and have a discussion about those questions with the uh, Speakers. Please stay online after each session once again. We appreciate the sponsorship of Seoul Jewelry Industry Support Center and Korea Jewelry Industry Promotion Foundation. And there are many other organizations who gave us much support. We extend our thank you for them. Let us begin the first session. Let's pay our attention to the first speaker. Let me briefly introduce him. He is the CEO of the Serene Technology Group, one of the world's leading technology companies for the diamonds, gemstones, and jewelry industries. Over the last 20 years in Serene, David has played an instrumental role in the initiation, development, and introduction of many of the revolutionary innovations the group has brought to the diamond industry. Under his guidance, Serene's diamond planning system has become a de facto standard for the diamond manufacturing, and for the last few years, he has been spearheading Serene's introduction of innovative technologies to the wholesale and retail trade of the polished diamonds. Among these advances are artificial intelligence-driven polished diamond grading, diamond traceability, light performance analysis, as well as other digital solutions to enable today's diamond retailers to better interact with their customers. 
Keyhole uh, MBA from Kellogg Lakanati School of Business and a bachelor's degree in the computer science from Tel Aviv Jaffa Academic College in Israel. Okay, now let's pay our attention to him. David, you're on. Floor is yours. We cannot hear you. Thank, uh, thank you very much. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here and participate uh, digitally at the Searle International Jewelry Conference uh, for 2021. Uh, I hope that maybe next year we'll be able to visit physically um, um, as due to today's limitations. Uh, I'd like to give a word of thanks to the Seoul uh, Jewelry Industry Support uh, Center for inviting me to speak today. And I hope you'll enjoy uh, my presentation. Um, so let's jump right in. I'll just share uh, my presentation one moment. Um, so we are going to be talking about in the presentation about technology and how uh, technology uh, actually will shape uh, the diamond industry of tomorrow. Um, before I start, maybe a few words uh, about uh, Sarin, who Sarin is. Uh, we are a global uh, technology company um, that develops, uh, researches and develops technology for the diamond, uh, gemstone and jewelry industry with the main focus on uh, diamonds. Uh, we are an Israeli company headquartered in Israel uh, where we do all our research and development. Um, and we have a number of subsidiaries globally uh, in India, um, in the US in New York, which takes care of the Americas, uh, in Hong Kong, which is our hub for Asia. And then we have a, a wide range of distribution channels globally in over 40 countries, uh, including, of course, uh, Korea. Um, although we are talking about uh, how technology will change the diamond industry tomorrow, actually technology has been revolutionizing the diamond industry for the past three decades. Uh, and Serene has been introducing over the past three decades a number of different revolutions, uh, technological revolutions that have really changed the face of the diamond industry. Um, for the first 25 years, the main focus was on diamond manufacturing how to take a rough diamond and transform it uh, into a beautiful polished diamond uh, sold uh, to the consumer. And that is where a large majority of the technological development from Serene uh, uh, was focused. Um, and as you can see in the slide, over the years, um, multiple different technologies were developed in order to optimize how rough diamonds are manufactured. Over the past five or so years, we've been focusing uh, very much on the retail side, um, how diamond, how technology can contribute and add value uh, to uh, the further downstream part of the diamond pipeline as the polished diamond is sold through wholesale, retail, and then to the consumer. As I mentioned, we are a technology company uh, investing uh, over the last decade uh, close to $150 million in research and development. Uh, in order to create uh, added value for the diamond pipeline. And just to give you some idea of the scope of the use of technology in the uh, diamond pipeline today, uh, about 100 million diamonds pass through Serene's technologies every year. Um, to give an idea of uh, that scale, uh, you have every year approximately only 1 million uh, uh, polished diamonds above one carat. Uh, whereas the large majority of polished diamonds are below one carat. Um, and as I said, throughout different technologies, uh, through the different stages of the diamond pipeline, around about 100 million diamonds go through our technologies each year. Uh, our technologies span the entire pipeline from the mines, through the manufacturing, down to uh, and all the way down to the uh, retail today. We'll be focusing this presentation on how technology can add value to the retail part of the diamond pipeline, which, as I said, is uh, uh, fairly new in the last five years we've been developing. Uh, we have a very wide range of different technologies that are involved in many different stages of the diamond pipeline um, from, as I said, the mine through the manufacturing down to the retailer. 
Um, I think one of the most interesting things um, that we can look in the past two years is how uh, the situation with COVID-19 has actually dramatically accelerated the use of technology uh, in the diamond industry, uh, whether it be at uh, the producers, the diamond mines that have started to shift to selling of rough diamonds to their clients through digital technologies, of course, the expansion of uh, the use of technologies in the midstream, the manufacturers, and then, of course, all the way down to the retailer and how the retailer today is becoming more aware and understanding that technology is an integral part of uh, um, uh, how they should operate in today's world. Um, so we can see that there is a dramatic increase in the use of technology. And uh, despite the many challenges that COVID-19 has presented to us in the past two years, there are many advantages that we can see are um, uh, coming from the situation where we were forced uh, to interact digitally. Um, I think the best example is uh, this webinar today, whereas a few years ago, um, no one would have thought of doing a webinar, a conference, an international conference digitally through Zoom. And today that is uh, more or less the norm. And I believe that as we look forward into the upcoming uh, years, we'll continue to see an expanded and accelerated use of technology in all segments of the diamond pipeline from the mines all the way down to the consumer. Um, as you can see on the slide here, um, uh, it's an image actually from one of the last video stores in Korea that shut down in 2012, uh, nearly 10 years ago. Once upon a time when we wanted to watch video content, we went to a video store. We rented a movie, uh, took it back home, put it in our VHS or beta uh, video uh, machine and watched the movie. Whereas today, uh, Netflix is basically the tool we use. And with many technological uh, revolutions, the actual need has not really changed. It's the way that the need is served. So if we look at today at the biggest technological companies in the world, whether it be Facebook or Google, they are basically advertising companies changing the way content is served uh, rather than through newspapers and television advertisements. It's through digital forms that are very much more focused uh, and very much more targeted. Uh, the same goes for Netflix. We're watching the same movies uh, that we watched 20 years ago. Just the way we watch the movies, the way that we uh, use the content is very much more different. And sometimes these so-called very small changes uh, actually make a huge difference and revolutionize uh, a different, the different industries that they're used in. Uh, we see that the same trend is happening in the diamond industry. And I believe that the way different processes that maybe today uh, look very uh, maybe impossible to change will dramatically change in the future due to technology. Uh, with the introduction of large amounts of data and the ability to analyze this data using artificial intelligence, I believe that we will start seeing or continue to see uh, dramatic changes um, in the diamond industry utilizing these advanced technologies. Uh, and this is one of the main focuses of Sareen is how to utilize the large amounts of data that are available today. As I mentioned, uh, over 100 million diamonds passed through our different technologies, how to utilize that data and advanced uh, processing of that data in order to create value at different stages of the pipeline. Um, and I'll be talking about a number of different areas uh, during the presentation. The first one I'd like to maybe focus on is uh, uh, diamond grading. Uh, diamond grading has been uh, around for many, many years, tens of years, uh, diamond grading has been done manually, uh, utilizing uh, people that have been trained in order to grade uh, the diamonds, the color, the clarity, um, uh, cut and carat weight, uh, the four Cs, as well as additional parameters. But today we are starting to see a dramatic shift uh, towards uh, digital grading, uh, grading using technology. And the advantages of uh, utilizing technology uh, in order to do grading are dramatic. They are not just uh, shifting from a manual process to an automated process. Very similar to the way that uh, Netflix did not just add value by creating a digital ability to uh, use content. Um, before I maybe jump into it, I'd like to show a short movie uh, regarding uh, automated AI-based grading. Uh, if we can play the first movie, uh, thank you very much.
Could, could we play the first movie? Thank you. We live in an age where change is happening faster than anyone could have imagined. More amazing is how fast the new is becoming the new normal. Artificial intelligence is making our life better, safer, and more efficient. In the world of diamonds, Serene was the first company to bring AI to 4C's grading, providing unprecedented consistency and giving consumers absolute confidence in their diamond. But the truth is, we're only just warming up. As we begin the new decade, Sarin is about to change diamond grading beyond recognition. With an approach that marries AI, machine learning and big data to deliver e-grading. E-grading will empower diamond retailers with exciting new possibilities like never before. Bringing the precise diamonds you need exactly when you need them. Expanding diamond evaluation possibilities far beyond the four C's. Reducing costs. Streamlining diamond sourcing. Accelerating time to market. Supporting true personalization. A fascinating new era of e-grading is on its way. We'll meet you there. This is the diamond industry reimagined. Um, so basically, over the past uh, several years. Uh, Grading uh, using technology has been uh, developed uh, in order to transform the manual process, which is prone to uh, inconsistencies, to a fully automated process, uh, whether it be color grading, clarity grading, and of course, cut grade, which has already existed for the past uh, two decades using technology to grade cut. Uh, the two final frontiers of color and clarity are now possible to grade using technology. Uh, by analyzing uh, large amounts of data um, and then enabling uh, artificial intelligence uh, based systems to grade the diamonds uh, automatically. Um, naturally, just like with any uh, new technologies, uh, there is still a long way to go being able to cover uh, different types of diamonds, whether it be fancy colors uh, or other segments of diamonds that may be very particular. But uh, the ability today to grade uh, the four Cs fully with technology is already here. Um, but it goes a lot beyond just the regular four Cs. And um, when we talk about grading, there are many parameters uh, that today are important uh, to the diamond retailer or to the consumer that are not necessarily covered in uh, the typical traditional diamond grading of the four Cs, whether it be personal preferences, like tinges of color, whether it be certain types of inclusions, cracks, black spots, and so onwards, that uh, certain uh, uh, consumers or certain retail brands would prefer uh, not having within their goods. So the ability to fine tune, uh, the ability to understand what type of goods uh, are being purchased uh, is possible today with technology. And if again, maybe I compare that with um, the traditional videos uh, moving to digital uh, videos uh, uh, with Netflix, when you used to want to understand a category of movies, it used to be action movies or horror movies or drama. Uh, but today, the ability to fine tune what kind of movie you want to look, if you look in Netflix, it's uh, graded according to the percentage of probability that you will like the movie because there are many other parameters that are taken into consideration. And this is all possible by using big data, by analyzing the data, and then be able to provide you uh, with the type of movie you want. The same uh, becomes possible uh, with diamonds, uh, connecting very much more effectively between what diamonds uh, type of con certain consumer segment wants, whether it be 
in Japan or Korea or the US, which are looking for different types of diamonds, different qualities, different preferences. Uh, so the ability to grade diamonds using technology opens up a very much wider range of possibilities than possible doing manual grading. Naturally, um, uh, one of the biggest advantages of automated grading is the ability to provide very consistent and very accurate grading. No longer are parameters uh, like uh, fatigue uh, or uh, the mood of the grader or the culture impacting how the grading is done. Um, technology is very consistent. It's not impacted by any environmental um, parameters or any human factors. And therefore, you're able to achieve a very much higher level of accuracy and repeatability. Um, with today's consumer uh, who trusts technology, we believe that this is uh, uh, the new trust uh, in tomorrow's world. It's the trust of technology rather than manual processes, which, as I mentioned, are prone to error. Um, we go along beyond uh, just diamond grading, as I mentioned, many different parameters of the rough, of the polished diamond can be graded through technology, not just the typical four Cs, uh, the ability to grade other parameters such as beauty or what would call light performance uh, become possible with technology, imaging of uh, the polished diamond with very high levels of actuary, accuracy to provide the consumer uh, information about uh, that polished diamond all become possible with technology. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the leading uh, retail brands in Korea, uh, Golden Dew, uh, utilize the technology in order to present uh, the beauty of their diamonds, the light performance uh, of their uh, diamonds in the retail store itself through digital technology that they can present uh, to the consumer. When we talk about uh, technology, uh, sometimes we get stuck with just information, with data. Um, but we believe that a very important part of today's technology is how to deliver an experience to the consumer rather than just information. Um, therefore, uh, the importance of taking data and presenting it in a way that creates an experience in the store is a very important part of the revolution of technology in today's world. Uh, we'll see a little bit later on in the presentation how uh, you can utilize different types of data within the sales process in the store to create that in-store experience that not only provides information, but provides, as I said, an experience within the store. Um, I'd like to talk about a number of different trends at the consumer level and at the retail level uh, that are um, uh, very relevant for today's consumer. Uh, a lot of talk, of course, about millennials uh, and the new younger generation. Naturally, uh, we cannot not talk about uh, the digital experience uh, with the younger generation. Uh, today, the sales process actually starts at home uh, on uh, the, the cell phone, whether it be um, or the tablet uh, or the computer uh, that the retailer, that the consumer starts doing his um, uh, homework on what product he wants to buy, where he wants to buy it. And the whole sales process actually starts at home uh, through digital um, uh, tools uh, that the consumer uh, checks information about the product he wants to buy. Um, but it's not enough just to remain uh, with the experience uh, that starts at home. It's very important that this digital experience continues into the store to connect between the uh, initial part of the process that starts at home with the process in the digital store and therefore, enabling uh, digital information for your consumer becomes not nice to have, but a critical uh, part of uh, the um, sales process. Um, naturally, we talked about uh, information. Today's consumer is looking for very high levels of information, of trustworthy information, to be able to really know what he's buying, regardless of the product, whether it be a diamond, or even a, a, a pair of shoes or a, an electronic device. So understanding what the consumer, is, uh, the consumer is buying becomes very important. So providing transparent, uh, trustworthy information about the product uh, today, again, is a mandatory part of selling any product in today's world. 
Um, so the ability to provide this information in a transparent way to the consumer uh, is definitely a trend we're seeing expanding more and more uh, within uh, the general retail, as well as, of course, in the diamond industry. And being able to present this information in a very consumer-orientated way uh, to today's younger consumer. The last trend, again, which uh, for those of you who may have heard uh, the webinar uh, from the peers yesterday, the Insight Report, uh, there is a very uh, significant growing trend uh, of sustainability in general in today's world, uh, for, um, and the diamond industry is no different. The ability to understand where your diamond uh, or diamond jewelry comes from, how it was manufactured, uh, under what conditions um, and how it contributed to the communities, how it impacted the environment is becoming an integral part of the product. Um, therefore, one of the uh, capabilities that technology uh, can assist with is the ability to track the diamond from the mine, through the manufacturing process and all the way down to the consumer. In fact, uh, from the Insight report uh, yesterday that was published, uh, we can see that nearly 70% of today's uh, customers or consumers are looking for products that contribute to society and are actually willing to pay more, uh, anywhere between 10 to 20% more for products that are sustainable, that contribute to their communities and the environment. Um, and we see this trend growing, of course, not only in the diamond industry, but uh, as well as in the uh, uh, most other industries as well. Uh, we have just introduced uh, a year or two ago um, the Diamond Journey, which is a technological capability of tracking the diamond through data, verifiable data, from the mine all the way through uh, down to the consumer. Um, one of the uh, um, uh, aspects of uh, traceability is the ability not only to provide information, as I mentioned earlier, but to tell a story, uh, to be able to show how that diamond actually transformed from a rough diamond that was mined, for example, in Botswana, uh, into a beautiful polished diamond, uh, and the whole process along the way, being able to visualize that uh, and show that and present that to the consumer. Um, therefore, utilizing the data that is collected uh, throughout the manufacturing process, uh, we are able to present in a very visual, appealing way uh, to the consumer uh, how that diamond was manufactured, where the diamond came from, and visualize that to the consumer in a way that he can connect to. As you can see here in the, the, the slide, uh, there are ability to provide digital information, as well as even printing out um, a physical replica of the rough diamond to show the consumer how his rough diamond actually looked like, as well as providing information about uh, the communities and how uh, the diamond mining contributed to those communities, how the environment was protected, how diamond manufacturers, um, again, are becoming more and more sustainable, whether it becoming carbon neutral, uh, how they take care again of their employees, and so on and so forth. So I believe that sustainability uh, is becoming an integral part of uh, the diamond industry and the ability to track diamonds from the source to the consumer will become the standard of tomorrow, uh, just as 4Cs uh, is today a standard of how to um, uh, price and how to sell uh, polished diamonds. And a few, um, just before I show a few examples, uh, real life examples, uh, use cases from uh, some of the uh, retail stores globally of how traceability is used in the store, I'd like to show a short movie about diamond traceability. If you could play the second movie. Thank you. Every joy, every trial, every love, every laugh, every rise, every fall. Just like a person, every diamond has a unique story waiting to be told. With Serene Diamond Journey, you can now chart the unique story of your diamond from its source all the way to becoming a beautiful sparkling gem. 
the mapping of its interior and exterior birthmarks to revealing its latent beauty to creating its ultimate shape. Everything is preserved. Nothing is forgotten. Providing unquestionable proof of diamond provenance and the ultimate in scientifically proven traceability. So now you can know your diamond as well as you know yourself. Serene Diamond Journey. Are you ready to discover yours? Uh, so going back to just show a few use cases uh, in the stalls, uh, we'll take a number of examples just quickly. Uh, by the way, the presentation is available uh, for all uh, the viewers that you can look afterwards. Um, here we can actually see uh, one of uh, our uh, client in a retail store in Japan. Uh, that uh, 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 sells the diamonds uh, loose and then enables the client uh, to uh, set them in a jewelry piece of their choice. Uh, so the client will then choose a polished diamond. Uh, but as we know, if you look at a polished diamond, uh, let's say of uh, a half a carat G VS1 quality and another polished diamond of the same size, color and clarity, they look very similar. Whereas the rough diamond uh, of these two polished diamonds can be very, very different. Every rough diamond is unique. Uh, and what this uh, retailer has done is actually uh, taken uh, the actual rough diamond. Uh, we have re uh, recreated uh, the replica of the actual rough diamond that this polished diamond was actually polished from. And the consumer can actually see the rough diamond. If they scan the QR, they can see the entire journey from uh, rough to polish and the story of the manufacturing and basically this is used as part of the sales process in the store and so engaging the consumer with the journey of the diamond uh, as it traveled from the mine all the way down to the consumer and enabling the consumer to experience this journey and so this is an example from Japan um, we work with uh, uh, many, uh, with all the all the players in the pipeline, from the mines through the manufacturers and all the way down to the retail. So many different partners that you are able to source uh, diamonds from with the diamond journey. Um, another example from Japan uh, using uh, traceability of the diamond journey, a special design called the Sakura, which is uh, um, uh, uh, the, the uh, blossoming uh, in the in the summer. Um, and uh, utilizing again uh, digitally information of that diamond journey as it travels from the mine to the consumer. Um, another example of how it's used in, in Australia, uh, providing again a replica of the rough diamond in a very uh, uh, nice set, uh, um, showing that uh, diamond journey. Um, I think one of the, uh, just to summarize maybe, uh, so we can have a little bit of time for some questions. And three main trends, which I think as, uh, should be um, uh, uh, focused on at the retail level uh, with regards to technology. One is becoming digital. The ability to shift um, uh, uh, the focus and the engagement with the consumer digitally, this does not mean selling only online. It means how do you engage your client from the moment he starts looking for the product online? How do you draw them to the store uh, through digital means and how do you continue that digital experience in the store itself. So the shift to digital uh, is something that is here, it's only accelerating uh, and it should be embraced. Um, it does not mean moving to sell online uh, predominantly or only, but how do you combine the digital world and the physical world together. The second trend as we talked about was uh, sustainability uh, and in the diamond industry that means uh, um, being able to understand where the diamond comes from, how it was manufactured, um, and the story of the diamond uh, from the mine to the, uh, to the consumer, the diamond journey. And the last trend that we discussed was uh, the shift from manual grading to uh, digital grading, what we call e-grading, uh, which we believe that uh, in a number of years, just like uh, video stores uh, disappeared in the last video store uh, that existed in Korea was 2012, we believe that diamond grading will shift to technological uh, um, uh, um, 
means, uh, therefore, eliminating the need for physical grading labs and shifting that ability to grade diamonds much closer to the client. Um, thank you very much. Uh, and if you have any questions, we'll be happy to take them now. Thank you, Mr. Block, uh, for your presentation on the new technology of the diamond industry. I think there are so many new uh, technologies that uh, we should catch up with. Uh, still, I think I am on a you know video generation. So <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, I have some uh, questions from the audience. Um, Okay, it's about um, e grading. Can you hear me, David? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay, it's about it's a e grading meaning. Uh, are you giving uh, e report only, not the paper report? Okay, that's actually a good question. Um, we believe that uh, the consumer today is shifting to only digital. There are of course uh, sustainability aspects to that of not using paper, um, but today's consumer today is basically connected 24-7 to his digital uh, phone or e uh, iPad. Um, so we believe very much in digital, but we of course do have the old fashioned uh, paper reports. Uh, so um, that is of course available, but we do believe very strongly in digital. Um, and for those clients who still want uh, paper reports, we of course do provide them, but we see uh, the switch to digital only uh, by many of our clients that are shifting to digital uh, reports only rather than uh, paper reports. Uh, on, with this the question, is e-grading for, um, you mean doing all the four C's, uh, for uh, what size of uh, diamonds? Is it there's any limit? And is there any limit on the shapes also? So as with any technology, the technology starts with, uh, I would say, the main uh, stream diamonds, um, uh, larger sizes, uh, typical shapes, but there is no uh, technological limitation to the technology. Uh, the adoption of the technology, as with uh, any uh, um, new technology in the diamond industry, uh, generally starts with the more typical and common uh, types of diamonds and then shifts to the more uh, extremes, um, so smaller diamonds, uh, irregular shapes, but uh, technologically wise, there is no limitation to technology. And we believe that actually technology will enable uh, to grade uh, cheaper and smaller diamonds cost effectively as the technology uh, evolves and develops, uh, becomes more cost effective and faster. Oh, I see, thank you. Um, another question is about this e-grading is the is done at your uh, lab only, or is it really kind of, is it this kind of instrument is available for <laughs> average uh, wholesalers or retailers? So uh, the idea of the technology, just like as I mentioned with Netflix, is to move the technology uh, to the client. Um, not having grading labs that need to send the goods, sending diamonds to a grading lab takes time, uh, it's expensive, you have cost of insurance, the cost of money during the time that uh, uh, the diamond is shipped to the grading lab. So there are many uh, very significant overheads of shipping a diamond to a grading lab. And our objective is to move the technology to the manufacturer, to the wholesaler, uh, so that they will be able to do it in-house on one hand, but being able to do it without uh, uh, um, uh, influencing or affecting the grading process. So the way it works is that the technology uh, is located at the client. The information, the diamond is scanned, the information goes up to the serene cloud. We analyze the data and grade the diamond and then send back uh, the grading to the client. So uh, yes, um, the objective is that diamonds will be graded, uh, what we call at the source, as close to the source as possible. That will improve uh, cycle times for the industry, enable much quicker time to market and sourcing of diamonds. There are many, many advantages uh, that what e-grading will provide. We have been testing for the past uh, three years 
the technology in our grading labs. We have grading labs in India and Israel uh, that we utilize the technology. But uh, as of uh, the end of this year and beginning of next year, we are starting to introduce the technology to clients in the field. So it's a suite of technologies that enable grading of the different parameters um, uh, that make up the four C's and beyond that four C's. Yes, uh, this is a very simple question. Uh, how long does it take to do the e-grading for one carat round? So there is not really any significant difference in terms of the time it takes to grade a one carat or a half carat or five carat diamond. Uh, the time it takes is very short. Um, I think uh, the alternative is sending it to a grading lab. And that's the comparison of the time. Today, uh, due to the uh, scale up after COVID, grading can take anywhere between four weeks to six weeks or even eight weeks. Whereas once you have technology in house, if you want to grade a diamond tomorrow, uh, it's possible to do it for tomorrow. So that's why I said cycle times uh, will be reduced significantly. In that way, you can reduce inventories, uh, um, not uh, have to uh, hold large quantities of inventories, uh, reduce the amount of dead inventory uh, that is not suitable, rejections. So, for example, when retailers buy polished diamonds, many times they send a certain percentage back to their supplier because they do not meet the retailer's criteria, even though they meet the four C's criteria. So the ability to reduce rejections uh, is also uh, one of the big advantages of utilizing e-grading. That's, that's great. Thank you. Uh, another question? Oh, uh, it's about uh, Diamond's uh, journey and the traceability question. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the diamond origin report questions, um, it's been around for a while. And um, how can you, uh, you said, scientifically prove the origin or the, the mine of the diamonds? But as you know, De Beers uh, do not uh, give a specific mines. So, so naturally, yeah, a very good question. Naturally, uh, the mines are an integral part of uh, diamond traceability. And of course, uh, in order to provide origin, there is a need for participation of the mines uh, in diamond traceability. We work together with many of the mines uh, globally, uh, and we believe that as traceability becomes more of a mandatory, or a, a not necessarily mandatory, but a standard that is expected by the consumer and by the retailer, that all or most mines will uh, engage in traceability programs. So uh, we're not yet there uh, that all mines uh, engage with traceability programs, but I think we're well on our way. And at Serene, we work with many of the diamond mines globally uh, in order to start uh, the process at the mine. Uh, you mentioned that the Beers does not mention the mine, uh, but uh, just uh, a number of countries of origin, that's correct. Um, to be honest, I'm not sure that the consumer needs to know the specific country. Again, that's a question that I think many of the retailers ask themselves. Do we really want to uh, share the country of origin or is it more important that uh, uh, the origin of the diamond comes from a sustainable source that you are able to track and able to know where it comes from um, rather than knowing that it came from Botswana or uh, Russia or Canada. So I think that's a good question, but I believe that the consumer and the retailer still hasn't really answered, do we really need the actual specific origin? Uh, but in order to do so, of course, the participation of the mines is uh, uh, crucial. Yes, I mean, some uh, consumers want to know specific answers and some do not care. That's what, what they, what's going on uh, these days, yeah. as you know. A lot of products are like in made in, you know, so and so yeah. countries and, and so forth. I believe that if the consumer will want to know uh, the origin of the diamonds in terms of country or even mine, that the industry will uh, enable that to happen. So I think it's it's a matter of what the consumer wants, and if the consumer wants that, I believe he will receive it uh, eventually. Yes. Uh Another question is about this traceability. Is it uh, white diamonds only, or is it available uh, for the fancy color diamonds? Because your presentation no, is only white. Yeah. 
It's available, traceability is relevant for all types of diamonds. Um, uh, there is no limitation in terms of the ability to do traceability on fancy colors. Um, of course, fancy colors due to their rarity and uh, the fact that they are very much more expensive, traceability becomes very important. Uh, we didn't talk about it in today's seminar, but we also have a lot of different developments on fingerprinting of diamonds. So you're able to uh, track the polished diamond once it is uh, fully polished uh, and be able to provide a, a unique ID uh, for a polished diamond. Um, and naturally, uh, for uh, fancy colors, uh, that uh, is, of course, uh, uh, possible through the technology as well. Yes, you said uh, some retailers in Japan uh, showing this uh, diamond traceability report, right? Your report. Yeah, Japan, Australia, Europe, uh, US, uh, Singapore, uh, many uh, countries already, really retailers in different countries are already adopting traceability. And I think, as I mentioned in the Insight report yesterday from the Beers, mm -hmm. we see the importance of sustainability aspects uh, ranking very high globally in uh, consumer preference. And as I said, are willing to pay more for diamonds that are traceable. That's, that's uh, something of very recent development. Okay, great. Yeah, I recommend that anyone who hasn't read the Insight Report uh, take a good read. It has very valuable and important information. Okay, great. Thank you so much, David. And uh, thank you thank for you. joining and joining us, you know, early hours from uh, your area, right? Okay. Yeah, it's, it's okay. morning over here. Yes, and then uh, hope to see you and then, you know, in person in the near future. Thank you, yeah. Mr. Block. Thank you very much. Talman, uh, SSEF, yeah, uh, Michael. Uh, we will move on to the next uh, session. Yeah, the speaker is Michael Stanley. And Jankan, Mepungan, and Hushiko Shagas. Before that, we're going to have the computer a couple of minutes uh, setting is shut at Stark to get them there. Director of the Swiss Gemological Institute, uh, which is called uh, SSEF. He started his gemological career after completion of his PhD thesis in mineral mineralogy in 1996. Uh, Apart from working at SSEF, he's also lecturing at the University Basel, and he's also a frequent guest speaker in gemological seminars worldwide. Uh, furthermore, he has published numerous articles on gemstones, pearls, and new analytical methods in gemstones and pearl testing in all major gemological journals. Finally, he is appointed member of the Scientific Board of Swiss Gemological Society, of the Executive Board of the International Gemological Conference, member of the HKTDC, Technical Board of the Standardization of the Zaydite Testing, and he's also a member of the Com Committee on Gemstone Varietal Names on CIBZO. Wonderful. Thank you so much for this nice introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here, actually, today. And uh, I would like to thank, for sure, uh, the Korea Jewelry Promotion Foundation and also the Seoul Jewelry Industry Center for this invitation. I'm very honored to be here today. Um, today, we start with the presentation, Freigeben. So, today I would like to uh, show you the beauty, the beauty of science. Maybe we start with the beauty of gemstones. I mean, gemstones are beautiful. Uh, 
And what I want to show you is that the science behind gemstones is beautiful too. I mean, specifically, as we are testing uh, some of the most important and prestigious gems and jewelry offered today in the market. But before we start with cases, I would like to introduce to you the Swiss Gem Institute, SSEF. Uh, SSEF is an acronym. It stands for the Swiss Foundation for the Research of Gemstones. So we are a foundation uh, nearly 50 years ago, has been founded by Swiss trade organizations, and we are as such a non-profit organization serving the trade in uh, all aspects in Switzerland and internationally. And we have a lot of research, as it is part of our uh, foundation, which means also a lot of collaborations worldwide. Uh, we are located in Basel, so for those who know Europe and even Switzerland, uh, you're welcome to visit this nice but rather small city in Switzerland. Um, SSF has several, uh, let's say, parts. We are working uh, and testing gemstones, loose or set, color stones, diamonds and pearls. But then we have an important branch which is about education. So we run uh, many courses on all levels where you can learn uh, from basic level up to scientific level, even for other labs, how to test uh, gemstones and pearls and how to understand this material fully. We have for sure then the research and development branch where we are uh, doing research on topics related to the trade, new treatments coming, new origins coming into the market, and we also develop instruments specifically for labs, but also even for the trade. And finally, we are uh, consulting organizations like uh, Stipjo, ICA, uh, LMHC, and so on, specifically on nomenclature or on disclosure issues, how to disclose a treatment or a synthetic material uh, in the trade. So that's what we cover at SSF. For sure, course programs are something which are uh, important for us because we want to have the consumer finally even, but also the trade educated. So for those interested in courses, I suggest you also to have a look on our website where we have free online courses on specific stones like diamonds, uh, rubies, sapphires, emeralds, pearls, and more to come as uh, uh, quite a broad and deep uh, information on all these stones. But finally, the most important for sure is gemstone testing, I mean, color stone testing, diamonds and pearls as a service for the trade. And uh, this is also how finally we gain our money because we are not funded by the government or by any kind of uh, private whatever, but we have to work uh, through this service and to gain our uh, money for the lab. Okay, I just start with a few items exceptional items just to show you the range of materials we see and also the beauty and the exceptional quality so uh, to start with this jadeite necklace you probably have heard this is a jadeite necklace of historic provenance which has sold in hong kong in 2014 for a stunning price but also the material is stunning and it's absolutely beautiful as you see on this photo on the sunrise ruby, you see a chemical analysis on the right. So this is uh, has been sold at Sotheby's in Geneva from uh, 30, 000, uh, 30 million uh, dollars. And you see the stone of exceptional quality. Or 
here we have a cashmere sapphire which actually is uh, very exceptional not only in size but and color but also as we were able and i'm coming back to this later to do age dating on this stone so provide a geologic history of this material here we have a very exceptional uh, fancy pink diamond of as you see 100 carats so uh, this is also one of the stones we have tested in recent years and SSF just it shows you the range and uh, beauty of these stones and to finish here the pearl pendant of Marie Antoinette which was sold in Sotheby's again in Geneva uh, quite recently for a very uh, exceptional price it was connected to the beauty of the item, but definitely also to the history and provenance it has. And you see a radiography of that same pearl just besides done at SSF. So this is just to show you the uh, items we see uh, at SSF and the high-end quality, which is a pleasure and the, uh, to see this beauty and to work with it. Now I would like to focus today on two uh, topics mainly. Uh, one is about nomenclature, let's say identification of uh, uh, corundum varieties finally and later we will talk about origin determination of corundum. Uh, to start with when we talk about gemstones, color stones, we first talk about the mineral. And the mineral has a name which is well defined scientifically. And this is very clear. This is a diamond. Here we talk about a corundum or a beryl. These names are defined internationally, and we can analyze stone by classic methods or advanced, and we identify the mineral. More difficult, however, is the attribution to a gem variety. Is it now a ruby? which is the red variety of corundum, or is it a pink sapphire, which is just a pink variety of sapphire, of corundum. And we have to say, these variety names are not well defined, at least not scientifically. Usually they are linked to the chemistry, the visual color, let's say. Uh, they may be defined historically. Uh, truth is, consumers mostly know the variety name. They know ruby, but they have no idea that sapphire, in fact, is the same. It's just a different color of corundum. So in a lab situation, we have to deal with these nomenclature issues to be consistent over time. And uh, this consistency, I want to show uh, here with mm, some examples. And it starts with the question ruby and pink sapphire. In fact, the separation between these two color varieties of corundum is only based on the color saturation, which means you just look at the stone and now it's red, saturated red, or it's just pink. The point is that we talk here about a grading system somehow similar to diamonds, where we have colorless diamonds and we just add a U of normally yellowish, and we get from D to whatever grade you have. And here we have two categories and a separation. The point is, in colors and color stones, we talk about the three-dimensional color space, because we don't have only saturation, but we may have also a color U going more to a purple, bluish, color so we have a more complex situation at SSF we use a master set of stones as you see it here which has been produced by the International Color Association in the 80s so many decades ago still very useful as we can just compare a stone with these master stones and tell the difference Interestingly, for sapphires, there is much less of a strict separation. Whether it's a dark blue uh, corundum or a very, very light blue stone, this is all considered sapphire. If we have very light 
grayish blue colors, we would switch at SSF to a term called fancy sapphire. Or if there is no color at all anymore, we are now talking about the colorless sapphire. But we see already here the, di the difference between these uh, uh, variety names and separations, and it's very important to fix as much as possible the limits specifically for the labs, but finally also for the trade. And to add on this, uh, we entered the most complex variety of uh, corundum, which is for sure Patparacha, because Patparacha is actually, again, not just a range of saturations, but it's a very, uh, let's say, range of colors, which all have to be subtle, a mix between pink and orange. And the circle should show you uh, the limit of Patparacha, and when I go to the right side, I'm talking about pink. If I'm on the left side, I'm talking about orange sapphires. And on the top, I have sapphires of beautiful, fancy color. So too much saturated to be called Patparacha. Again, here we have a separation based on color. Uh, what we can say is beryllium diffusion treatment has to be excluded to be called Patparacha. But the complexity is not so easy. Here we have a sample which looks somehow orangey pink. There is an orange tint to it, so visually it might look like a patparaccia. It is, however, not, because the color, the orange color, comes from an inclusion. It comes from iron hydroxide, or rust, which naturally is present in this stone, in a fissure, as you can see in the micro uh, photos, and the color of the stone alone is just pink. So this would not be uh, Patparaccia. Also, the color first looks quite similar. Or then we go to the next situation, and I hope it works, which is a sapphire, it's a pink sapphire you got in the lab, and the client claimed it to be Patparaccia. So difficult to understand. In fact, this stone is not stable in its color. By a short uh, illumination with a UV lamp, we have switched the same stone to a distinctly orangey color, and we can switch it back to pink, just by exposure to a light, let's say, even in a window, a display of a, a jewelry shop, the stone would switch back. Again, here we cannot talk about the Patparaccia. This is a stone which is interesting, even beautiful, but it shows a change of color. And for those who are interested in this topic, uh, there is a publication which was uh, done uh, three years ago, uh, giving full details about this process and these uh, specific stones. So this is concerning nomenclature. And I want to switch over now to origin determination as we at SSF are very much involved. And this is one of the main services we provide to the trade for colored stones. So where does the stone come from has an influence on, uh, let's say, the emotion and finally on the pricing of a stone. And uh, as a lab, it's our task to provide an uh, expert opinion about the origin. What you see here is a, a sunset at Mogok, a very beautiful area, which historically, since many centuries, is the source of some of the most un uh, exceptional rubies, sapphires, and other gemstones in the market. And here you see a world map with some of the most uh, productive mining areas, and in blue, for sure, is sapphires, and in red, you see ruby uh, sources and we will go into uh, sapphires and we will have a look specifically to Kashmir. Why are these gemstone deposits uh, formed or how they are formed? It's all linked to large scale uh, uh, geological uh, events. Let's say the collision of India with Eurasia 
which has produced finally the Himalaya mountain range and as a byproduct at the same time has transformed all the rocks and has formed many gemstones, rubies, sapphires in, in Myanmar, Kashmir and so on. Now this is explaining also the distribution, for example, along the Himalayan range of all these sources. For a lab providing uh, origin detonation as a service, it's very crucial and important to have reference collection and reference stones from single uh, uh, sources and to visit also these mines to get a geological, um, to investigate the geological formation process leading to the formation of gemstones. And what you see here are photos I have taken from Mokok again, where you see uh, here the Baba, a sapphire mine, the largest producing sapphire mine currently in Mokok, uh, and again a very uh, beautiful scenery actually. Let's talk about Kashmir as uh, the source uh, of, let's say, the normally most appreciated and highly priced material in the market. To be very clear, Kashmir is a source which has provided all qualities of sapphires. You find superb, beautiful stones of excellent quality. You find also very low quality stones. So an origin is not an, is not a quality by itself. Very uh, interestingly, the Kashmir mine was only very short time productive by the end of the 19th century. And since today, there is nearly no new material coming. So whatever is in the market mostly is repolished again and again. So these are old stones. There is only a limited quality, uh, quantity available, which is on top of their beauty of some of these stones driving their value and price. Interestingly, Kashmir sapphires have small, subtle and beautiful inclusions. What you see here are uh, and the two very exceptional Kashmir sapphires sold at auction and inclusions which are very telling for this source. And it's part of the beauty to work with the stones, to work with a microscope, to look inside and to see the beauty, but to learn much more about the inclusions because they tell us a lot how they formed and where they formed. Or well, here we have a very uh, characteristic inclusion again for cashmere sapphire. It's a parkosite, which is an amphibole, magnesium amphibole, in sapphire from Kashmir. So seeing such an inclusion is already telling us very much that this is a uh, Kashmir sapphire. However, stones which show a similar velvety, say, uh, beautiful blue color are known from different other sources also. And the most, uh, uh, let's say, most well-known source of such stones in recent year is Madagascar. So what you see on the left, this ring shows you a superb Madagascar stone, uh, which a very similar color appearance as you would expect from the best quality of cashmere. So this is another uh, important topic to see. Beauty is not linked to an origin. You can find the best quality in, in Madagascar or in Kashmir or other places. And at some point, I would even suggest to buy a stone on beauty and not just on a label of an origin. And what we see now in these smaller micro photos are just uh, showing you different features, let's say similar features, but they are slightly different between stones from Kashmir and stones from Madagascar. So again, microscopy is a very beautiful approach and classic approach is very helpful. It's much more helpful than many other advanced technologies because these inclusions actually represent the host rock in which the sapphire formed and these host rocks in Madagascar and in Kashmir were different. However, we 
need to go further. And we want to analyze stones with advanced technology. And what you see here is actually on the left two so-called Raman spectra. Raman spectroscopy is a method where you excite molecules in a substance to vibrate. And this vibration you can register in a spectrum. And these two spectra show inclusions in a gemstone within the stone. We can go with a, with a laser inside the stone without any uh, destructive uh, testing. We just focus with a microscope and we analyze the vibration in this zircon inclusion. And we see a difference in the zircons, which are often found in Kashmir sapphires, to zircons found in Madagascar sapphires. So this is a, a very good direction and a scientific proof. If we have a stone, we analyze the zircon and we can get information about its origin. And on the right side, you see a trade alert, which we published about four years ago, because at some point a new source was found and Kashmir-like material entered the market in quantity and was finally sold as Kashmir uh, to some extent. And we had to say, stop, be careful, this is Madagascar stones. So you can find all this with the link here also on our website for those who are interested. By using this Raman spectroscopy, we can not only say something about Kashmir or Madagascar, we also can have a look on what is about Burmese sapphires compared to Sri Lankan stones. So this is a tool which has been, uh, which is applied since many years at SSF, and we have published about this scientific article uh, in collaboration with the Gubelin Gem Lab uh, just very recently. So for those interested, please have a look in this. So analysis of inclusions is very important and analysis of chemical composition is also very important. Whatever we produce as an opinion of an origin is based on a combination of microscopic observations and data acquired with advanced technology, whether it's now trace element composition, molecular vibration or absorption behavior. And here you see just uh, uh, an option to analyze trace elements at very low uh, limits of detection with a so, uh, mass spectrometer. And the specific instrument we use at SSF and is a time of flight mass spectrometer, which provides you all elements present in a gemstone at the same moment, just at once. It's like a snapshot. And you see the complexity, all these lines and peaks you see are in fact related to isotopes of, of elements. And we can calculate out of this then trace element composition and we can plot them into plots. And what you see here in these plots is first a three-dimensional plot of vanadium, magnesium and gallium as trace elements and in blue the Kashmir cloud of sapphire. So it's quite a located cloud. But if we start to include other sources, we have to say from the trace elements there is a certain overlapping. So trace elements are helpful and good, but it's not like a black box and you put the stone inside and you know the origin. This is way too simplified. We need to have additional data from other sources, whether it's our Raman spectra or inclusions. But still, it's very helpful. So this data, for sure, there is a lot of data because we have more than 50 elements we measure and we measure on every stone's uh, uh, a time period and a certain uh, amount of spots. This data can be worked with statistical methods. And uh, what we see here is finally from just a pure elemental distribution, magnesium to gallium, to uh, uh, principal components, statistical methods, and what we use actually this is, is a form of uh, artificial intelligence, it's machine learning, so the machine actually takes all the data and it tries to find 
the closest matches and it creates uh, it's a, a so-called unsupervised clouds of data. So the Kashmir and uh, uh, the Madagascar data, you can kind of separate it also. In the beginning, it was overlapping. Another approach is to have a look on the age of the stone. Now, this is something which we can only provide do on stones which have an inclusion like zircon, rutile, apatite, which is at the surface. If this is the case, we apply age dating and we don't even charge the client, we just do it. And this age dating provides us an information as, for example, here, a stone uh, from Sri Lanka, which has an age of about 560 million years. So this age fits very well with the geological formation of sapphires in Sri Lanka uh, during a pan-African uh, metamorphic event. Or we have an age, as for this, 22 carats, uh, Kashmir sapphire of 25 million years, much younger. Geologically spoken, this is the age of the Himalaya mountain range formation. So India pushing into Eurasia. So by, I don't, by, by uh, measuring, calculating the age of a stone of unknown origin, we can sort out, is it now Sri Lankan or is it Kashmir? Now, age dating is anyhow a very interesting topic, and we apply it also on organic matter. And here we have access using age dating and with carbon or radiocarbon, the same as has been applied, for example, on mummies from Egypt. So this method is uh, easily uh, applicable on pearls because they contain a lot of carbon. It's a main element of their uh, structure and we take just very few milligrams from the drill hole and we have here a, a necklace where we have analyzed uh, a selection of pearls and this necklace has a provided uh, historical provenance and yes we can prove the age is historic we talk about this uh, uh, 16th to 18th century these age dating methods normally are not so precise. You cannot tell a day, but at least we can say this is definitely not new pearls found just very recently. This is historic and it fits very well with the provided documentation. So it's valuable for the high end pearl trade to do this. And at some point, it's also important to know the DNA, to know finally the species, whether it's now a question of CITES where you cannot export or import corals based on CITES protection, or whether it's just to, to find out more about a specific pearl or ivory, where does it come from, what is the animal it produced originally. We are able to provide this service to the trade by using very tiny amounts of milligrams of material. So as an example here, this Corallium japonicum coral necklace. You find all and many much more information about this on our website. And I invite you to have a look there and to get informed about what is possible today with all these methods. And with this picture, I'm nearly at the end. Uh, at the very end, we talk about beautiful stones. They are very important to always understand there are people behind this. and. It's very important to protect and support these peoples wherever they are. And we try our best to support them with our work, with our daily work in the lab. So with this, I want to finish. Um, thank you for your attention. I hope you have some questions. It will be a pleasure to answer your questions now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Okay, let me uh, get some questions. Okay, uh, about the color separations on rubies. Okay, and then mm -hmm. you uh, you uh, showed that uh, you're using a master 
rubies only, master, right? But is it really scientific separation? Because some, how can you really divide day and night? This is ruby and this is fancy. Ever. Just some, some colors are not even. Exactly, exactly. I mean, exactly this is the point. I mean, if you talk about diamonds, we have a stone which is isotropic, so has no pleochrism, which is normally cut in ideal proportions, normally has no inclusions and no, no color zoning. So I, I would say it's quite straightforward to go through. If we talk about the color stone, usually you have a problem of the cutting style, window situation, you have a problem of inclusions, color zoning and pleochrism. So this is a problem where I have to say this, you cannot just simplify it on, uh, I mean, we measure the color, but we have to say this is always a tool which has limitations. And the best today still is to have a look visually on the stones. And nature unfortunately provides the full range from red to pink, but at some point we have to set a limit. And the best still is to use a master stone. There is no way to attach it, for example, to the chromium concentration. The chromium gives the red color. So we cannot just say at this level of chromium it's pink and at this, because as I said, these stones are sewn very often and you may have even no chromium at the surface but a lot of chromium below the surface and the color is deep red. So a measurement of the chromium is not, would not be scientific at all. So still, we have to rely on the master, master stones. All the, all labs do, all the exactly. Stones. Color stones, this is still the, the best. Right. So that's yeah. the same, uh, same uh, applies to the sapphires as well, for the all the master stones? Yes, absolutely. You have seen master stones, exactly. These were master stones at SSF. Mm -hmm. Okay, and this is one quick question about, you showed the paparazzi changing color. It was uh, not paparazzi, but you said one, uh, one light is a pink, the other light is uh, orange. So can you call that color change paparazzi? No. <laughs> a color change is finally you, uh, used as a term for material when you just have two different light sources and I switch from one to the next, let's say candlelight to daylight and I see immediately a different color. What we have here is rather a situation like somehow like comedian diamonds. So it's a situation which has to do with a color center which you can activate or deactivate over time by exposure to a lamp. So this is a different process and so should not be called a color change, uh, whatever, patparaccia. Um, because it's a very different uh, property, which we see here. So we just, as a standard, and also this is based then on LMHC and all uh, these uh, labs attached to it, would not uh, call this a patparaccia, because as you buy a patparaccia for a very high price, you expect to be able to give this stone to your daughter in 20, 30 years with the same color. But if it's just pink, something has happened. Thank you for, the, for your explanation. Uh, yeah. It's about uh, Kashmir and Madagascar sapphires. Uh, I, I think you're, uh, you're testing uh, using diff, uh, several methods uh, to identify the origins. And is it mm -hmm. really any, I mean, is it like impossible cases that is impossible to... Uh, yes, yes, absolutely. Again, we are finally always giving an opinion uh, of an origin because we have not been with the stone and we have not seen the stone coming from from the ground so it is possible that we have stones which are showing uh, features let's say microscopic features fitting with cashmere but all the analytical data is not fitting so in such a situation we do not express an opinion on the report we will write a letter together with this uh, report where we state why we cannot and to explain that in this is the situation at the moment it might even be that in 10 years we can do 
because science is going forward every year and this is just at the moment not possible to provide an origin for a stone. Oh, okay. So, I mean, the question was like, um, can you, uh, could you please say about what percentage that you cannot mm -hmm, uh, define mm -hmm. the origin? Not so easy. I just can say, first of all, rubies uh, and emeralds, it's, it's very small amounts. Most of the rubies and sapphires, we can clearly uh, indicate an origin. However, for sapphires, the, the situation is much more complex. I would say about 5% of the stones, uh, we don't give an opinion, expert opinion. I see. Yeah. Another important point is to understand, origin determination is something where experts of one lab will give an opinion, and it might be that another lab gives another opinion. And I would not dare to say that there is a mistake, because it's like in other fields, like in paintings or in the medicine, that different doctors or different experts may have well-founded different opinion on something. Right. Yes, yeah. thank you. Um, we know that uh, one question is this one. Um, there are low temperature treated Mozambique rubies, right? And then <coughs> are they uh, low temperature treated Mas Madagascarian sapphires? Cause the same problems? Is it yes, I mean, you see, uh, when we talk about heat treatment of corundum, classically we speak about temperatures about uh, 1200, 1400 degrees or even more, which have an influence on the inclusions. They transform by this process and it's rather straightforward to detect and to, to recognize this. Now, when we come from the lower end and say, okay, we use now 800 degrees or even less, the problem is that most features on, let's say, most inclusions are not changing. So the microscopic aspect, which is still very important, is not helpful. And now we have to use technology. We use infrared spectroscopy, Raman spectroscopy, uh, basically trying to, uh, to register the molecular vibrations of this material. And... Uh, at some point, we have to say, we uh, learn more and more over the years, and the low temperature heating of corundum is something which only in the last uh, four or five years, we think we have the tools to analyze it. Beforehand, there was on our labs, there was a difficulty to detect this treatment. We have published in 2018, I think, a press release, about this and we have we always i mean that's the policy of us if we always provide the data and also the, the the criteria so you see the spectra on which we which we use in infrared spectroscopy to separate low temperature heated uh, whether it's uh, sapphires or rubies doesn't matter uh, from on um, uh, stones which have no indication of heating yeah. thank you um Another question is about uh, color stability. Um, when, uh, when the stone is uh, for color stability is tested, <laughs> you, I mean... Okay, this is a test which we apply since many, many years on all yellow sapphires or orange sapphires. It is a test which is very simple. And since now about five years, we also applied on all patparachas. For sure, the client have to agree. So we will call, or we'll, uh, write an email asking that he agrees that we carry out this so uh, stability test. The test itself is very simple, can be done even by the trader himself, herself. It is, first of all, a test where you expose a stone which has a kind of a patparacha color uh, to a strong light source for three hours. We use a fiber optic lamp and we place a stone about five centimeter in front of the light, very close. So this is a time for relaxing uh, or uh, deactivating a color center and the stone could turn to become pink. Uh, so we know the first color is now pink, that's a stable color because it's related to chromium. 
And now I can try to activate the color center again, and we do regularly, by using a UV lamp, long wave UV lamp. We place the stone even on the lamp and we wait 10 minutes. So in about three and a half hours, you know, now we have activated and the stone may be orange, as you have seen in this ring. That was exactly this process we went through. And you can go back and forth. Just now, when it's orange, you put it again three hours in front of the lamp. So what we do normally is we get a stone, we will send it back in the same color. So we can bring it back to the same color, but still, in very rare cases, I cannot remember one, but it might be that we cannot bring back the color. So that's why we have to ask the client, are you, do you agree? If he doesn't agree, which is okay, then there will be a comment that the color was not tested, the stability of the color was not tested. I see. It's actually a standard produce, produce, uh, production that now for all labs I know of. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, this is something where the trade knows and they will normally agree to do the stability test because at the very end it's in their interest. If they sell a very expensive paracha to a client and the client comes back with a pink stone after two months, they have a problem. So you just Better to know first. that only one stone, one case that, that the color did not come back after it's... it's uh... I don't remember, no, because actually we have seen uh, lots of stones and we were always able to go back and forth. Okay, no problem. Is there any case that uh, permanently stayed the color, I mean, color changed under UV permanently? Is there any chance that color can be changed to a different color under UV exposure? I mean, we talk about shades now for, of yellow. So it might be that the stone cannot be activated anymore. So the stable color pink remains and then it's a pink sapphire. It's not, there is not, uh, let's say, uh, uh, and there, it's not without any value anymore because the stone is still beautiful, but it doesn't have this orangey tint anymore. But it's not like you get a colorless stone back because the chromium is always there. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, this question is about the age date dating question. Uh, it's about gem tough testing. Uh, is it mm -hmm. uh, is it destructive testing or is it there's no harm done? To the stones or to let it put like this there is no harm done to the stone because what we do still is we a blade we take a very tiny amount of the stone normally at the girdle so you hardly see it the, the spot which we use for taking uh, corundum uh, particles has the diameter of a hair so it's super small spot which you see with a loop yes but which have no influence on the weight of the stone whatsoever. I mean, we weight the stone with three digits after the comma, and it is still exactly the same weight. So it's not, no, it's not destructive at all, but it's, we call this uh, uh, finally semi or quasi non-destructive, we call it, yes, quasi non-destructive. We, we need to take it. Okay, but is it uh, then smaller? Size than the one day you do LA ICP test on the. Uh, it's similar. It's very similar. Oh, you know, laser ablation is the method is finally just to get the particle out of the stone, and you just can change the diameter of the laser spot. So some use a large spot, some use a smaller spot. We use a smaller spot, and uh, others will use a larger spot. But at the very end, it's it's very same. Yeah. I see. Thank you. Oh. One last question uh, mm -hmm. is about um, in in your experience. I know I know uh, you've seen so many gemstones. Uh, mm -hmm. Which stone is the most memorable one for you? <laughs> I know uh, so many. Very difficult because we have seen so many exception stones. I think stones which which have a history which is documented over centuries are personally for me uh, some of the most interesting cases 
So I remember, uh, uh, for example, from uh, from uh, a setting with pink topaz from Wittelsbach. So this is uh, a German uh, royal family, and this was done in the 19th century uh, for his daughters. He provided several sets of uh, of tiaras and necklaces and so on, and. To see the history of this item, to see the beauty of these stones, this is a combination which is, is something of the most beautiful I have ever seen. But then I have to say, I mean, I'm working since 20, more than 20 years at SSF, and every day we see very exceptional stones. And I'm just uh, uh, fascinated by nature, what kind of beauty is produced by nature. And we are happy to work with these stones. I'm sure you will see many more beautiful stones <laughs> also. Okay, thank you so much for your presentation, Michael. And then, uh, and I know you joined us of, in early hours, uh, your time. So thank you for your time again. And uh, hopefully we can meet you all in real, right? In person in the near future. Exactly. Soon, I hope to. Yes. It will be my great Please pleasure. Please to Seoul and give, uh, give the presentation in person. Thank you. Thank I will you. do. <laughs> great pleasure. Uh, 이제 uh, 두 번째 uh, 세미나는 마쳤고요. And 이제 마지막 uh, 세, 세 번째 세미나를 곧 this 시작하겠습니다. Uh, 세 번째 발표하실 분은요 온현성 월국 주어리스 한업 연구소 소장님이십니다. So uh, 이분은 1992년에 uh, 주어리 업계 입문하셔가지고 uh, 약 30여 년째 활동하고 계십니다. Uh, 10여 년 전에 uh, GIA 그 공부를 uh, he's going to talk about the topic topic of the Stage is laboratory grown diamond market in Korea. After Wolgok Jolly Research Center has founded and he has developed and he has worked in the center very hard. 네, 여러분, 반갑습니다. 저는 한국의 고성용 합성 다이아몬드의 시장 동향이라는 주제로 Hello, my name is Hyun Sung Won from the Work of Jewelry Research Center. I'd like to speak on the topic of laboratory grown diamond market in Korea. Uh, to begin with, let me briefly explain about the Work of Jewelry Foundation and its research center. Uh, the Work of Jewelry Foundation is committed to the development of Korea jewelry industry. It's a non-profit organization uh, founded by Mr. Lee Jae-ho, chairman of Lee Gold. It was established in 2009 and has invested in uh, invested much money in the educational scholarship, research, academic programs, as well as the welfare projects. And also, we provide uh, up-to-date information to the jewelry industry and the workers in there. So now, let me start the presentation. First, we will look at the overview of the recent Korea jewelry and natural diamond market. And on the distribution trends of the synthetic diamonds and their jewelry in global and Korea market, consumer awareness and the purchasing trend. And finally, the industry response and future prospects. Uh, due to the time constraint, I will not uh, mention the definition of the synthetic diamonds. But please note that in accordance with the international organizations virtually, recommendations of ISO, CIB, ZEO, and the FTC of the United States, the terminology is unified as laboratory grown diamond and gem quality synthetic diamond.
Okay, let's first take a look at the Korean jewelry market. Okay, as you know, the pandemic started last year. As of 2020, the size of the Korean jewelry market was $4.9 billion. According to the Euro Monitor, Korea's market share is not that high compared to the global jewelry market size, which is about $208.6 billion in 2020. But in Asia, Korea is the third largest market after China and Japan, and it is within the 10th in the world market. Despite the pandemic that started in early 2020, the size of the Korean domestic jewelry market has hardly decreased. However, it appears to be declining after its peak in 2016. Let's have a closer look. Uh, we can say that the Korea jewelry market is divided into two categories, which are non-wedding jewelry and wedding jewelry markets. Compared to the previous year, the non-wedding jewelry market increased by 0.6% and the wedding jewelry market decreased by 9.5% compared to 2018. What are the reasons? Let's consider one by one. Uh, the first reason seems to be a sharp decrease in the marriageable demographics. The number of married couples has decreased by about 70,000 couples over the last 10 years. As a result, the wedding jewelry market decreased about 406, uh, 400 million U.S. dollars. Naturally, the wedding jewelry market is also expected to diminish due to this kind of decrease. The second factor is that the new consumers called the millennials or Generation Z are exercising greater power. As seen in the jewelry buying share by age group, in the past 10 years, those in their 20s and 30s have already been influential in the jewelry consumption market. And the third reason is the growth of luxury jewelry market in Korea. According to the Korea International Trade Association, the import of jewelry products has been steadily increasing over the past decade. Since 2013, the gap between jewelry import and export deficit has widened. Over the same period, jewelry exports have increased by 2.1 percent, while imports have increased by 220 percent. In particular, the sales of three major luxury brands have grown by 258 to 327 percent over the past decades. And finally, the fourth factor is the growth of the online market. According to the recent survey result, the size of online jewelry sales increased by 10.2% and the purchase rate was 15.9%. Uh, in particular, this rate was the highest compared to the previous surveys. Now, the purchase rate of online shopping malls have exceeded that of department stores or offline shopping malls. As you can see, the Korean jewelry market is changing to meet the needs of the consumers. Let's recap the four reasons again. First, the trend of declining jewelry consumption market due to the decrease of the marriage population. Second, the widening influence of the newcomers called Millennials and Generation Z. The third one is the expansion of the luxury jewelry market. And lastly, the changes in the distribution market, including especially the online market. Uh, now let's move on to the distribution status of the Korea synthetic diamond market. Uh, let's take a look at the status of the global laboratory grown diamond and the natural diamond market.
Currently, natural diamond production is declining by an average of 5% per year due to the aging and depletion of mines. Uh, especially last year, due to the pandemic, the production of natural diamond was 111 million carats, which is a decrease by 20% compared to the previous year. And experts say over the next 30 years, production will decrease by 65% or up to 90%. But as you all know, uh, the demand was really low in the beginning, but the demand for laboratory-grown diamond has been steadily increasing in the global diamond market. Diamond market. As of 2023, it will account for 3 to 4% of the, of the entire diamond market and will grow to $15 billion by 2035. Yes, the production of gem quality, laboratory-grown diamond, is on the rise in quantitative terms. Last year alone, 600 to 700 million carats were produced mainly in China, India, and the United States. In particular, with the development of the technology, high-quality synthetic diamonds are being mass-produced and flowing into the consumer market. And how does this affect the market price? According to the Global Diamond Industry 2021 announced by Antwerp World Diamond Center and Bain & Company, the price of laboratory-grown diamond has steadily declined in the market. The wholesale price fell down by 20 percent, and its retail price uh, declined by 35 percent compared to the natural diamonds price respectively. Uh, in line with this trend, more and more large jewelry companies uh, choose the laboratory-grown diamond as their new products. The Beers, which is the world's largest diamond specialist, is investing a brand called Lightbox. Pandora and Swarovski are actively and aggressively engaging in the pro product development and marketing activities. In particular, the Beers intends to dominate the synthetic diamond market, while at the same time protecting the natural diamond market. Yes, these companies are developing and selling products with advanced production technology and price competitiveness. Now, let's take a look at the Korean synthetic diamond market for jewelry, mainly the market trends, consumer awareness, and the distribution trends of the laboratory-grown diamonds for jewelry. Um, recently, Korea's laboratory-grown diamonds imports have been increasing rapidly uh, at an average annual rate of 93% over the past four years. In the first half of this year, uh, the record already exceeded 3 million U.S. dollars, and it will be broken again shortly. Moreover, considering that the significant unofficial imports, we believe that the total import of the synthetic diamonds will be even greater. But here's a reference for the laboratory-grown diamonds trading volume. In 2017, international, uh, intentional mixing of Malay-sized synthetic diamonds with natural Malay diamonds created a big problem in the Korea diamond market. At that time, the Seoul Jewelry Center's lab promptly introduced the diamond ident identification equipment and provided a free identification service. Since that instant, over 1.3 million diamonds were identified, and over 17,000 synthetic diamonds were detected. Mm. Uh, even though that incident was well handled, we need to keep an eye on this problem. Um, currently, Mali laboratory-grown diamonds account for more than 75% by the volume in the Korean market. 
0.1 to 1 carat diamonds make up about 20 percent, and 1 carat or more make up 5 percent. Recently, the consumption of diamonds with a grading report from 0.3 carat to carat plus has been decreasing. Uh, now let's have a look at the synthetic diamonds price. The price in Korea has been steadily declining. Let's say the natural diamond is 100%, then the wholesale price of the synthetic diamond is only 32%, and the retail price is 51%. Yes, the affordable price is the strongest advantage of the synthetic diamond. And experts predict that demand will increase when the wholesale price drops down to 20% level. Um, recently, we surveyed the opinions of experts on synthetic diamonds, and they believe that the synthetic diamonds will account for 22% of the natural diamond jewelry market in the future and will eventually replace about 35% of the cubic zirconia jewelry market. For your reference, the cubic zirconia jewelry market in Korea, which is not found in other countries, exceeds $1 billion. We believe that synthetic diamonds will soon replace some of these two markets in the near future and eventually become an independent market. Then what's the current market size in Korea? Uh, this year, the size of the domestic synthetic diamond retail market is believed to be $31 million. And the size is about 3.5% of the total diamond jewelry market. However, considering that the market size is rapidly increasing and import volumes and the exports opinion, we believe that in 10 years it's going to grow up to $200 million U.S. dollars. Then what, the, uh, what do consumers think about this kind of uh, synthetic diamond? Uh, we had a consumer survey conducted by uh, Gallup Korea, a specialized research institute, and about 37% of the respondents said they have heard of synthetic diamond. In particular, women and those in their 30s and 40s both exceeded 40%. In another survey of consumers who had already purchased wedding jewelry, uh, the intention to purchase synthetic diamonds for their wedding jewelry was 40.4%. Uh, in particular, uh, people in their 20s are the largest potential cons uh, consumers in the wedding market, and they accounted for 46%. And these results are much higher than the expectation of the diamond industry. So this market is expected to grow rapidly if marketing and promotions are tailored to the consumer's preference. As I mentioned earlier, millennials and Generation G have exceeded 40% of the consumer population. They enjoy online shopping, they have a high interest in the environmental and la labor issues, and they also have an open and practical consumption mindset. So we believe that they are also very open to buy synthetic diamonds compared to the older generation. Uh, there are three channels for the consumers, uh, which are the jewelry franchise store and specialized sellers and wedding jewelry specialist stores and the e-commerce markets. Uh, these are the main channels that the synthetic diamonds can be uh, accessed by the consumers in the retail markets. Uh, let me briefly uh, repeat again. The channels are jewelry franchise stores, specialized sellers, wedding jewelry sellers, and e-commerce markets. Uh, first of all, there are more than 800 franchise jewelry stores nationwide. They mainly sell fashion jewelry products to young customers. And since last Christmas season, two jewelry franchise groups started selling fashion jewelry items set with uh, synthetic diamond in about uh, 300 stores. They emphasize the low, pr low price and offer a variety of gift items and fashion jewelries. 
and they plan to increase the quantity according to the response of the consumers. Uh, secondly, the specialized jewelry companies that mainly sell the synthetic diamond. Uh, they have professional knowledge and information about this kind of diamond. And the synthetic diamonds are used both for their low price jewelry and high-end jewelry. Although they are not large in number or size, uh, the response from the consumers is quite good. Thirdly, most wedding jewelry companies deal with natural diamond. But recently, some of them recommend synthetic diamond wedding jewelry to budget-conscious consumers. If many young couples become interested in the synthetic diamond wedding jewelry, it can, be, it can bring about a big change in the Korea diamond market in the near future. Uh, the last channel is the e-commerce market. Uh, the synthetic diamonds are also distributed at online platforms. Due to the nature of this market, consumers can be easily misled by misinformation about the synthetic diamond. They, they use wrong expressions such as L diamond or lab diamond, and they sell synthetic diamonds as a natural product or sell it as a similar product. As the online market is growing, we are concerned that the damage to the consumers will also increase. Then how should the Korean jewelry industry view and respond to the synthetic diamond market? Uh, first of all, let's briefly summarize what we have considered so far. Uh, the laboratory ground diamond market will expand with low price, high quality, and various products and distribution channels. Second, the consumption market is expanding, centered on the millennial and Generation G, who are the new purchasing power. Finally, in the near future, they will become an independent market and replace some of the existing jewelry markets. It's going to uh, occupy up to 4% of the total jewelry market. As experts predict, unlike other synthetic gems, the synthetic diamonds will have a significant on the industry as well as the consumer markets. We believe that there are three challenges that the industry has to solve in relation to the synthetic diamond. So we can ask ourselves what are needed for the healthy growth of the domestic diamond and jewelry industry while protecting our consumers. First, we need to standardize the confusing terminology because it can cause misunderstanding among consumers and we need to provide a guideline for sound transaction. Second, we need to provide accurate information and education to sales associates and the industry at all levels. Lastly, we need to establish mechanisms in order to monitor and handle any potential dispute. Fortunately, the Korea Jewelry Industry Promotion Foundation, which is now hosting today's conference, established the Korea Diamond Council in January 2020 in order to protect and revitalize the Korean diamond market. Seven related companies, Jolly Association and Research Center, are participating in this concert. Since its establishment, it created a definition and sales guide regulation based on the international standards, such as JSO, CIBZO, and FTC. In addition, the Korea Jewelry Association, which is an organization of retailers, have started operating a consumer protection center related to the synthetic diamonds. They are planning promotions and campaigns targeting consumers and other retailers. We believe that they are going to play a very meaningful role in our future. Yes, now it seems that the Korea synthetic diamond market has passed the introduction stage and has entered the growth stage. So the key is healthy coexistence of the existing market and the new market. We need to protect the existing diamond and jewelry industry and also facilitate the synthetic diamond market as a new business opportunity. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening.
We also appreciate your speech as well. So we're going to talk about the Kore current Korean like grown diamond market. There is a question from an international viewer. So, uh, it is well known in Korea, the lab grown diamond import tax law is quite high. So, what is the view of Korea? Uh, over three different uh, revision of the relevant laws, the tax is uh, lowered than before. So, uh, the, uh, despite the increase of the import volume, the tax burden is not as high as before. So about the recognition of Korean consumers about lab-grown diamonds. So the data shows a very high level of the recognition of lab-grown diamond. So compared to the data from other countries, can you tell us the data from other countries? So there is. Uh, we have learned that the consumers in the U.S. or Japan have a similar consumer awareness level as the consumers in Korea. But as we have mentioned earlier. Uh, this type of market is changing very rapidly, so uh, it affects the consumer, the level of the consumer's awareness as well. So the termi terminology about regarding the grown diamond. So you had the center has many plans about the terminology. So there are law uh, connected related to the terminology standard. So when purchased, they consider the purchase of like grown diamond if they have confusion of the status of the diamond. If it is a uh, laboratory grown or natural diamond, it's going to be a big issue. So if, so if there is uh, yes, this is quite a serious problem in our new market because it can uh, seriously damage our reliabi reliability among the consumers. And more and more consumers try to buy the synthetic diamond. Uh, thankfully, we have a guideline and there are more movements to deal with this kind of problem or uh, prevent this kind of problem. So we will put more effort to provide more information uh, uh, to the sellers to prevent such kind of problem from re, uh, reoccurring again. Uh, ultimately, we have to create, create an uh, atmosphere where the consumers can uh, totally rely on the sellers of the synthetic diamonds and uh, uh, trust the sellers to tell them exactly what's the difference between the natural diamond and the synthetic diamond, and which one of them they are actually buying. So we need to put a constant effort uh, in the coming years. So, uh, lab grown diamond now it is on the market from high end uh, jewelry brand. 
So are they a Korean brand or not? Yes, most of them are Korean uh, brands and they have quite uh, well known to the consumers in the domestic market. And uh, the volumes of such uh, jewelry are increasing. And we expect that more and more uh, consumers uh, will uh, try to uh, will try to buy this kind of jewelry. Uh, especially the online markets, uh, we have we can find uh, more consumers. From your speech, the brand Pandora or Swarovski, they now they are selling like brown diamond. So are they on the Korean market, diamond market? Uh, uh, to be honest, we do not have any concrete da data in our hands today. But as you know, uh, these days the consumers can buy the foreign products online, which means directly from other countries. But considering the online market movement, we know that more and more consumers are aware of and enjoying these kind of uh, foreign brands. Is there any other questions? It is about uh, diamond testing. So is there any standard when Korea uh, <laughs> diamond market when they uh, test the first seed of diamond? Uh, in my knowledge, I believe the KS standard is also applicable to the test that you just mentioned. But to be honest, in the Korean uh, diamond and gemstone testing uh, area, there has been a lot of uh, small or big problems that, we, that have been found in recent years. And we still need to uh, introduce the high technology analysis or testing equipment. Regarding on the test, a uh, grading test, so is there any also uh, or is there any same standard uh, between synthetic diamond and natural diamond? Uh, recently, more and more uh, gem uh, gemstone laboratories start to uh, perform the testing for the synthetic uh, diamonds. But we are uh, honestly at the uh, starting or beginning stage. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, some sellers try to deceive the consumers by uh, mixing the Mali diamonds, synthetic Mali diamonds with the natural ones. Uh, that's why we uh, uh, desperately need a very clear and accurate uh, testing uh, standard and testing equipment. So we first need to establish a reliable standard for this kind of testing, in which case we will avoid uh, losing the consumer's reliability. So we should deal with this kind of issue soon. So really appreciate you shared very important uh, data and information with us. Yes, uh, the three sessions we have prepared for today uh, have been uh, presented to you. Uh, we believe that uh, you have found a lot of interesting and uh, enjoyable information uh, through today's conference. Uh, uh, we also feel very thankful to the today's speakers. So, uh, 
We thank you again. And a lot of uh, people have participated in today's webinar. We also appreciate uh, your interest. Uh, for the last thing, we'd like to ask you to uh, participate in the questionnaire, and we will have a small gift for you. Thank you.